And joining us now, Dan Ariely. He is the author of Predictably Irrational, The Hidden Forces That Shape Our Decisions. He's a professor of behavioral economics at Duke University, and I'm glad to meet you in person this time. Same here. You were actually on this program a few weeks ago. But it was. Uh, you forgot to mention that I'm the uh, co-founder of the Center for Advanced Hindsight, which I'm very proud of. <laughs> the for advanced hindsight. Advanced hindsight. You see, this is why we wanted you back here in person. You told you were on the program a few weeks ago from North Carolina. Yeah. And then you told us after the program you were actually going to be coming up to Ontario, and we thought, well, why don't we do this again? And it is good because it's very hard to just talk to an empty camera. So talking personally Although is fun. You did fine, if I recall. <laughs> Thank you. Let's start by uh, playing a clip of your president, and then we'll go from there. Here's Barack Obama. Roll tape, please. My president. You see when. This recession began, many families sat around the kitchen table and tried to figure out where they could cut back. And so have many businesses. And this is a completely reasonable and understandable reaction. But if everybody, if everybody, if every family in America, if every business in America cuts back all at once, then no one is spending any money, which means there are no customers, which means there are more layoffs which means that the economy gets even worse. That's why the government has to step in and temporarily boost spending in order to stimulate demand. That's exactly what we're doing right now. Okay, let's unpack that a little bit. I appreciate that that may be a rather simplistic explanation of what his administration is attempting to do and why it's no. attempting to do it. But does it seem to you, given that clip, given what else you have seen and heard from him, that this administration does have an understanding of why people are behaving the way they are at this time? Uh, I think so, at least uh, to a much greater extent than any other administration uh, we have. And if you think about this speech, it has two elements. The first element is a social coordination. So think about the following idea. Imagine that we all decide to behave badly. We could devastate the system. And think about maybe a run on the bank. Let's say a bank has 2% of the assets in cash, and one day, 3% of the people come and they want their cash. The bank will have to sell the 1% extra they don't have in cash for a great loss, and soon enough, the, the bank would collapse. It's a social coordination effort. If you tell people, just hold off, be good, everybody could benefit. The social pie could actually increase. But by everybody trying to be selfish, the whole benefit could be, could be negative. So the first thing that he's trying to do is he's trying to say, look, this is a social coordination game. If we all behave nicely and contribute to the social pie, we would all be better off. Now, the interesting thing is, would people listen? Right? Are people going to give him credit, get behind it, and say, yes, we understand this game, and we are willing to not defect. We're willing not to follow our selfish interests. We're willing to cooperate in a bigger way. His approval ratings suggest that they are prepared that they to listen. Are. Does that seem that way to you? Uh, yeah, it does. And, it if, does. and if you think about the stock market in the last month, it's amazing. There's really nothing happening in the stock market. <laughs> Nevertheless, things to be happening, I mean, in, in a way that it kind of discoordinated from the economy. So I think it is the, the, Obama, the Obama effect. Hmm. Behavioral economics is your thing, so we're going to follow up with a lot of questions about that. What does it have to say about the effectiveness of government spending, for example, on infrastructure and social programs in a downturn like we're experiencing now? Yeah. So th there are many ways to think about how spending is going to influence individuals. One is about trust. So if you think about most Americans, and I'll take myself as an example, I don't know anything. If, if I just looked at the world around me, I wouldn't see much about the recession. I go to work, everybody's there, not, uh, not anybody at, at my university has lost their job. Uh, unless I go to shopping malls on Christmas, which I didn't happen to be because I'm Jewish, I don't think I would have noticed any real change in behavior. Nevertheless, me, like everybody else, kind of panicking, right? What do I do? What do I well, do? How do I, news, how right? do I react to this? And, and I think the news is part of it. I'm not sure if you're contributing personally, but, <laughs> but in general, we look at the news, we say everybody is sad, everybody is devastated. Uh, journalists have this saying, you know, if it bleeds, it leads, which basically says, put the emotion of people up front. So we hear all these stories about, oh, this person lost his job, and that person lost his job. And we're so afraid of that that we say, we might, by God, we have to change something. We have to scale down. We have to do something. And we get into a panic situation, which, of course, just exaggerate the problem. Now, what does investment in infrastructure does? It gives us a sign from the government that things are going to happen. It gives jobs to people who don't have jobs. And it gives us a sense of progression. And I think, in some sense, reduces the fear and anxiety and allowing people to continue behaving as they, as they did. There's a palpable benefit to seeing those cranes in the sky, then? There is. Huh. 
Okay. Let's talk uh, income tax cuts. And again, we're going to start with a clip from the president and then come back with a question. Michael, roll tape, please. Make no mistake, this tax cut will reach 120 million families and put $120 billion directly into their pockets. And it includes the, mo the most American workers ever to get a tax cut. This is going to boost demand, and it will save or create over half a million jobs. Okay, following up again on this theory of behavioral economics, how, how effective are tax cuts in affecting consumer confidence at a time like this? So I think the most interesting question is to think about how the money is being given. So here's the story. In February 2008, we had an experiment, uh, courtesy of Bush, in which every American got about $600 in a one big lump sum. In the mail. In the mail. And it did nothing. It did nothing to the economy. Now, in, uh, in contrast, Obama is trying something different. He's basically giving the same amount, but rather than giving it in a lump sum, he's giving it in many small in installments over a year. And it's kind of an interesting question of which one of those is going to be more effective. Well, the Bush one we know was not effective in retrospect. What made it not effective? We don't know. We, oh, it made it not effective. People just saved the money. They just they, put it in the bank. They just put it in the bank. Now, personally, as a, as a scientist, I'm upset with both of these approaches. Instead of spending $140 billion or $120 billion right now on tax cuts, I would have loved them to see them spending a couple of million dollars, giving tax benefits to a few people, and seeing how it works out. Right? Let's do the right experiment before we go ahead and spend so much money. Um, but in fact, the Obama plan is kind of interesting in many ways. So think about the following. If you got a $600 check, what would you do with it? You're asking me? Yeah, what would you do with it? I mean, the first and obvious thing to do is you stick it in the bank, and then you think about what you do with it after that. <clears throat> OK, so that's one approach. Mm -hmm. And if you decide to spend it, what would you spend it on? Oh my gosh. How did you turn the tables on me here? You're starting <laughs> to ask me the questions now, and I'm not ready for these questions. Let me think. What would I spend 600 bucks on? No. Yeah. You know, I'd probably blow it taking my kids to the ball game or something like that. Okay. You know? yeah. So you do one big thing. That'd be several baseball games oh, for what it's worth. <laughs> you, you can buy seats for 10 bucks at the Sky Dome. Anyway, okay. keep going. So, so the idea is that in the, in the Bush plan, you get $600. You, f you first say, oh, my goodness, I don't know what to do with it. Let me put it in the bank and maybe worry about it later. Mm -hmm. Or if I do something with it, let me treat it like a windfall, a big lottery ticket I got or something, or a small lottery ticket that I got, and I'm going to do something special with it outside of the ordinary. The Obama plan is different, right? What would you do if you got $50 extra a month? Would you go to the ball game? Probably not. First of all, it would take a long time for you to realize that you have slightly more money in your checking That's account. It. Would, you, would you even notice it? It would take a while, mm -hmm. right? But, and if you did realize that you have 50 extra dollars every month in your checking account, what would you spend it on? Would you go to the ball game? Most likely not. Most likely you would spend a little bit more on groceries, a little bit more on gas. Maybe you would pay a little bit more on your credit card. So it's an interesting thing to think that the way you give people money can actually influence how they spend it. And the Obama plan, A, it's untested, right? We'll see what happens mm -hmm. in reality. But the interesting psychological element is that rather than giving people a big amount to spend all of a sudden on something luxurious, will actually translate into lots of little spending over a long period of time. But it's interesting. So you don't actually have a preference between lump sum or these smaller chunks in the, in the paycheck because you're not convinced either one of them will work. I'm not convinced which one will work better. Mm -hmm. I would have loved to do an experiment. But the interesting thing is they both work differently. Even if people in the Bush plan would have spent the $600, they would have bought laptops. They would have bought things that are bigger things rather than the Obama. And I'm not sure which one is better for the economy. But again, my big frustration is you know, we find all kinds of things in behavioral economics. We find that money is a very strange animal. It depends how you get it to how you decide to spend it. Mm -hmm. Not all money is the same. If you find it on the street, you feel differently. If you want it in the lottery, <laughs> you feel differently. Is it extra salary? You know what? If we call it tax rebate, you feel differently about it because you say, it's my own money all the time. You're just giving it back to me. It was never found money. And you feel differently about it than if you got a, a prepaid debit card with Obama's mm -hmm. picture and a statement that says, spend the government's <laughs> money. So all of those would be, have different effects. And I would have loved to test how they work. Regrettably, nobody's letting us do these experiments. But do you know which is actually better for the economy, a tax cut, a lump sum payment, or other, some other kind of windfall, uh, regardless of the size of it? So, so we don't know for sure. Mm -hmm. But I think the expectation is that the Obama plan is actually going to be better than the Bush plan. But I think the best plan would have been to give people a prepaid debit card. And the reason I think this way is that it would have separated the rebate money from the rest of your money. It would have been separate on a separate card, and you would feel differently about it. 
And if it felt like the government's money, we would have felt more free to spend it. It was like windfall. So it's all a question of how do you frame that money that would make a big, big difference. Hmm. The Treasury Department is trying to restore confidence in the banking system, as you know, by investing in key firms and taking some of these so-called toxic assets off the bank balance sheets. There is, of course, an enormous lack of trust in the banking system, I guess in the economy in general right now. Does it sound to you as if that approach is going to change people's behavior and get the job done? I think it would in five years. So, um, you know, the way, the way we deal with trust, trust is not a rational element. And uh, whenever irrationality is involved, it's a good idea to think about other institutions. So think about marriage. Imagine, are you married? I am. Okay. Imagine your wife had an affair tomorrow. Would you, uh, how long have you been married? Uh, remind me, why did we invite <laughs> this guy to come on the program again? Just uh, help, help me understand this again. It's all for a good cause. How long have you been married? Uh, how long have I been married? Another trick question. <laughs> Uh, seven and a half years. Seven. Okay, so imagine that she only told you, I've only cheated to you one in 10,000 days. It's a very small probability, <laughs> right? Is this how you would feel about it? You would say, oh, it's a very unlikely event. It's a very small proportion, I know, so I shouldn't get excited That's about right. it. That's not how you would feel. It would take a long time for her to regain your trust. And that's how trust works, right? It takes a long time to build. It takes a very short time to break. So we have all this reduction in trust. And of course, the banks don't help themselves. There's the... The, the meltdown, the economic meltdown, there's all these bad behaviors. On top of that, there's the executive uh, bonuses. Mm -hmm. And now there's the question of, let's say we inject liquidity. Let's say Citibank and uh, all, all the banks are liquid and viable again. Are we going to trust them tomorrow? And the answer is absolutely no. That's not how trust works. Even if their books are balanced and they look like they're healthy, we're still not... It's the same people at the top. Are you going to trust them tomorrow? Why would you? And even if it's not the same people, it's the same positions. And because of that, I'm very worried that trust will take a long time to rebuild. Now, there are two ways to think about trust. One is like real trust, the trust you have between you and your spouse. You really trust each other. You don't feel like you need to supervise each other all the time. And you have this long-term trusting relationship. The second trust is the kind of trust that you say, you know what? I want to have a camera showing you, you me where you are at every moment of your life. It's not exactly trust, but it's saying, I'm going to have enough supervision on you that you can't possibly betray me in any, in any aspect of life. Now, I think that's the only kind of trust we can create with the banks right now. When it's not real trust, it's this basically trust that's saying, I'm just going to create a system that will make it impossible for you to violate anything. Okay, let's take the marriage analogy further then. No marriage could survive happily under those circumstances where somebody is constantly under the camera. That's right. So can we expect the people who will be managing these banks to perform their jobs properly, turn the economy around, which is what we want them to do after all, turn the banking system around if we're putting these kinds of strictures on them? Um, so, so I suspect no. I suspect no. And, and the reason is that these bankers grew up in a certain kind of environment and they've been a, a used to kind of framework of thinking. Mm -hmm. So imagine that I paid you for a while $138 million for your services. How long will it take you to think that you're worth this amount of money? A week, two weeks, Not I mean, long. very right. quickly you would yeah. feel that you're worth it. Mm -hmm. And now imagine that I said, I don't think you're very trusty. I don't think you're very worth it. I'm going to cut your salary. I'm going to put restrictions on you. How would you feel about it? Rotten. Now, it's not because the reality is rotten. It's because you've gotten used to a certain reality. And this actually goes back to the heart of your question. Do we clean up the banks and take all the assets out of them, all the bad assets out of them and create what we think of as a bad bank? I think a much better approach is to create a good bank. Let these banks do whatever they want. Let Citibank, Bank of America, whatever the equivalents are. Let them deal with the problem. Let's see them get out of it. And instead, let the government sponsor new banks. They're going to be clean, with new structure. Properly regulated. Properly regulated. Now imagine how successful new banks could have been by offering new people $500,000 a year. What the old bankers are thinking is offensive salary. New people would be lined up. If you said, here you have a chance to do a position that is crucially important for society. You're going to be the keeper of the economy. You're going to drive safety and the regulation of the economy. And on top of that, you get $500,000 a year. Wouldn't people line up for the job? Of course they would. I was going to say, that's a 10 out of 10 on the behavioral economic scale. And, that's right. and in political terms, that's a great winner as well. That's right. Did anybody suggest that along the way? Uh, people are talking about it, but I think the banks are kind of too big and creating new banks is too... Too difficult. There's kind of a middle ground that you can think about, which is the federal credit unions. 
you have a fantastic network of federal credit unions in, this, in, the, in Canada, and there's yes. very good ones in the States. And they have basically not been involved in these shenanigans. They don't pay as much. They lend to the community. They know who they're dealing with. And in fact, they could be kind of a pathway to good, to good banks. And on top of that, there's a lot of interesting things coming out. Lots of interesting startups are interested in banking the poor, helping people figure out their uh, finance, finances. So there's, I think, a lot of interesting stuff. And the government only helped those entities do better in the same 10% of what they're helping the, re the regular banks. I think would have had a much better situation. But what was the issue? The other ones were just too big to fail, and therefore they had to get in there and take the conventional approach. Is that it? I mean, we, we don't know if they were too big to fail. Right? We, we just don't know. Would you have liked to give it a try? <laughs> Um, yeah, I think well, so. Well, because you're a professor, so. you know, you, you might have found it an interesting case study. It's a great experiment. Yeah, but in reality, it's not a case study. It's real life and real people's money and all that. Could you really have done that? Just let them fail. So, so I think so. And and the reason is that I think um, we have a lot to benefit in the future. So, the truth is that economic reasoning is mostly untested. There's very strong beliefs about the economy, and very few real experiments with those things, like something is too big to fail, right? It's just a belief. But imagine that over the next 100 years, there'll be many banks that will be on the verge of failing. Now, we could assume every time that we shouldn't let them fail, and just assume this, or we can let one fail and see what happens. And if it's very bad in the future, we will know that it's not good to let them fail. But I think we need to experiment with those things. Actually, one of the big lessons from behavioral economics is that we don't experiment enough. Imagine the following. Have you ever interviewed somebody for a job? Have I gone to a job interview? No, no. Have you interviewed somebody? As in they came to me looking yeah. for a job? Yeah. Yeah. Sure. And are you good in interviewing people? Well, I'll let the viewers <laughs> decide that, but I think I'm OK. Yeah. OK. Most people think they're fantastic, right? <laughs> you talk to somebody for half an hour, you know very well if they'll do good for the job or not. How do you know that you're good at it? You have an intuition that you're good. You have good chemistry with people. But the only real way to know is to hire somebody you think will fail and see if indeed they'll fail. I mean, you don't tell them this, of course. Right. But you hire something that you think will not work out, and you will give them a chance for a year, and you see if you're right and you're wrong. Maybe, who knows, maybe all the people you passed out on could have been better than the people who work for you right now. That's an experiment <laughs> we can't do, though. You understand that, right? Why not? Of course you can. Because you have many more years to interview people. And if you say, look, I'm going to basically fail one time, or at least risk failing, but then be successful for 40 years, it's a good trade-off. This is a very different approach to, you, <laughs> to HR. <laughs> Actually, I'll, I'll tell you something kind of yeah. per personal. So uh, you know, I, I was burned many, many years ago. And, and the, the reason I started in behavioral economics was that I was curious about the questions of how do you take ba um, bandages of burned patients. So uh, you know, for me, it's a very practical question. Here I was. I had 70% burn. I was in hospital. Uh, removing bandages is incredibly painful. And anybody who removed bandages had the question of what do you do? Do you rip it off quickly? Short duration, high intensity, do you take it off slowly? Long duration, but slowly. Which one is the right one? The nurses in my department thought that the right one is the ripping one. So they would rip off and rip off and rip off. And fast. Fast. And because I have 70% of my body burned, it took about 45 minutes to an hour. So it, even fast wasn't that fast. And I would beg them to slow down. I said, please stop down, slow down. Let's take a couple of hours. Give me a break. And they told me two things. They, told it, they said that they were right that they knew the they, right approach. Better than you. <laughs> better than me. And they also told me that the word patient doesn't mean to intervene and make suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> and so on. It meant being passive and quiet and uh -huh. so on. And three years later, when I left the hospital and, and went to the university, I learned about the experimental method. I learned that if you have a question, you can bring it to the lab, and you can test it out, and maybe you can get an answer. So I was very curious about this question, which is a very general question. It says, if you have access with duration and intensity, how do you space it out to get the best experience over time? Even for, for a television show, right? Imagine that you have a certain duration. If you make your show twice as long, is it twice as good? What about would you do the crappy segments in the beginning <laughs> or the good ones in the beginning? I mean, how do you space it out? Not crappy. Less fantastic. Um, so, so when I started thinking about it, I didn't have much money. So I went to a hardware store, and I bought a carpenter's vice. And I would bring people to the lab, and I would crunch their fingers a little bit. And I would crunch the fingers for short duration and long duration and all kinds of patterns. And at the end of the day, I found that the nurses were wrong. I found that it would have been better to have a long duration because people do not integrate time in the way that they integrate intensity. Hmm. I found it would have been better for them to start with my face, which was more painful, and go down my body, creating an improvement 
pattern over time, and I found it would have been good for them to give me breaks. And when I went to talk to them and I presented to this, I learned two things. The first one was that my favorite nurse told me that I didn't take her pain into account. Her pain? Her pain. She said, look, for me, treating a, clearly making a patient in agony is, is often a thing. And she was my nurse for months and months on. She was doing to me every day. So she wanted to limit the duration because her pain was just proportional to the duration. But the most interesting thing was her reluctant to do an experiment. I said, why didn't you just do it for a couple of days just to try it out? And she said, look, my intuition was that you were wrong. So she thought I was <laughs> wrong. And <laughs> trying it out would have been expensive for her, not in terms of money, but in terms of time and agony. Mm -hmm. In the same way that for you to hire somebody you think doesn't work out well would have created some agony. Mm -hmm. And I think in general, we just don't do this experiment enough. We think about the short term. And we say on the short term, it's not worthwhile to do an experiment. But for the long term, it's fantastic. It and we just good. don't do those enough. I had not anticipated that the interview was going to go here. <laughs> but since you have, and I, I think I do need to say this, our, two things. Our makeup artist, Diane, has done such an expert job on you, I suspect our viewers can't tell that you've had burns on your body. And furthermore, that camera My over there, camera clear. one, is getting the shot of the side of your face, which uh, seems to have been untouched. It's yep. the other side of your face that has had more damage done. W would you mind just telling us how that happened? Um, no, this was a, a military flare. You know, it's one of these, uh, it's about this size magnesium bombs. Is this in Israel? Yeah, mm -hmm. in Israel. And one of those got exploded by mistake next to me. So uh, it was a huge magnesium fa flame, and I basically got stuck uh, around it for way too long. And when it, it exploded, I actually um, instinctively went back, and I was stuck between the fire and, and, and the wall. And luckily, I had another friend who was on the other side of the building, and he shouted to me. So I had to run against, again through the flames to, uh, to get out. And luckily, I did, I did because, because the whole thing exploded uh, soon after. But, um, so I had to run through the flames. So in the beginning, I was just burned in the top part of my body. And then uh, later on, when I ran through the flame, I got my bottom, the bottom part of my body. When did this happen, Dad? This happens, uh, whew. Uh, when I was 18. I'm 40, 41 now, so many years ago. Hmm. And, uh, you know, it's, there's a lot of bad things. You know, I was hospital for a long time, uh, lots of pain. Uh, I observed a lot of irrational behavior in the hospital. Um, and that turned you on in some <coughs> respects to behavioral economics. And that, and that turns me on for this. It gave me a lot of lessons for life. Uh, you know, it's kind of been a mixed uh, blessing. I wish it didn't happen, of course, but I learned a lot through the process as well. Hmm. Okay, thank you for that. And now let me get, get you back on to behavioral <laughs> economics. economics. Yes. We've got about five minutes left here, and I want to talk about a term that you, I think, coined, and, um, and I want some further explanation on. Learned helplessness <laughs> as it relates to people's involvement with the economy. Yes. What does that mean? So first of all, I didn't coin it. It's, 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 a, it's an old term uh, in psychology. And uh, the original experiments were very nice. Um, well, if you're an animal lover, it's a little bit painful. but. Imagine the following. Imagine you have a room with a dog, and from time to time the dog hears a bell. And soon after the bell, there's a shock, electrical shock. And the dog also has a little switch in the room that he can go and search, and if he uh, turns the switch on, the shock turns off. So if you're in that room, bell, shock, you find the switch, you turn it off. That's dog one. Dog two is in a similar room, but there's no bell and there's no switch. But dog two gets the same shocks as dog one. Dog one gets a bell, dog two gets nothing. Dog one gets a shock, dog two gets a shock. Dog one turns its shock off, dog two gets the shock off. So dog two has the same physical reality as dog one, but he has no idea what's coming and going. Mm. Imagine yourself like you're in the street walking around, people just slap you. I mean, invisible people slap you from time to time, right? You have no idea where things are coming from. And then you take both dogs and you put them in a new task. And it's a room with a little division, and from time to time there's a light, and if the dog jumps from side to side, nothing happens. But if they stay on their side, they get an electrical shock. Dog one figures it out, jump from side to side. Not very happy, but you know, they're perfectly fine. Dog two lays on the ground whimpering. They don't even try to find out what's going on. They don't even try to escape. They've basically learned that life is terrible, that you can't predict anything. And they've given up. And they've given up. And if you think about the recent history, I think we're all a little bit like dog two. Um, they told us to invest in, stock, in tech stocks. We did. And then what? Not a good idea. Then they said housing. Turns out it's also a kind of a questionable <laughs> uh, 
advice. Um, then, uh, then we thought about oil prices. You know, all of a sudden, it, it really rockets. And they tell us it's because of the war in Iraq. Well, the war in Iraq is different, and oil prices are at uh, half as much. The whole world seems much less sensible. And I think that's actually part of the issue, is if you think about ourselves as trying to understand the world, and at the moment we don't understand the world, we basically get this learn helplessness and depression. And by the way, these dogs that get less, help, get less helplessness develop things like ulcers and cancer, the immune system gets reduced. And I think we're all in that, in that boat. And the real question is, how are we going to get some understanding? How are we going to figure it out? Because even being able to tell ourselves a story about this, even if it's slightly incorrect, is going to be helpful for our psychological recovery. But learned helplessness, you're not advocating as the way to go. Oh, and no, no, no. It, it's it, terrible. It may, be, it may be the way people feel, but we've got to snap out of it, is what you're saying. Exactly, exactly. And I think it's actually, you know, if you think, again, I'll say something bad about the news, but if you think about the headline in the news, right, a man loses his job, this fails. I mean, all of these things tell us that how, much little, how little we understand the reality we're faced. And instead, what we need is a better, deeper understanding of what's really going on. What are the causes? How can we understand it? How can we think about it? Penny Baker, a very uh, good psychologist in, in Texas, basically showed that when people have these traumas, one of the good things out of it is to try and write a diary. Even if you try and write and explain it to yourself and you're wrong, you still create a picture for yourself and what the reality is. You feel like you're getting some control and it helps our recovery. Hmm. Dan, it has been great to have you here. I enjoyed our conversation over the line from Durham, North Carolina last time, but it's really terrific to meet you in person and to have you here. Same. And we remind everybody, your book is Predictably Irrational, The Hidden Forces That Shape Our Decisions. Dan Ariely, Professor of Behavioral Economics at Duke University. Great to have you here, and I hope you enjoy your time up here in Canada while you're here. Very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.